talk in this series. In the first couple, I talked about uh, the concept of Teshuvah as it seems to be emerging from Tanakh, and we looked at different cases of Tanakh. But today I want to look a little bit at themes of Teshuvah emerging from the Talmud. The Talmud, as you know, is uh, an enormous repository of Jewish thought and has... Uh, uh, and it's massive. So we need to look at different aspects. I just want to choose uh, two or three different ideas about Teshuvah that emerge from the Talmud that inform later sources. Uh, next week, I'm going to look at some more uh, later historical ideas about it. But they all, they all depend on the engine room of Jewish thought, the Talmud. The Talmud deals with various ways of looking at the Torah and the various ways of looking at Judaism. And I... I'm going to divide this small talk into different angles that the Talmud takes. The first we might call exegetical, because one of the things that the Talmud does, it comes along and it looks at the Torah, it looks at the, uh, the, the sacred scriptures uh, uh, of the whole Bible, and it interprets them in its own very unique way. And those of you who are familiar with Talmud will know the unique way that sometimes it approaches Torah and approaches uh, the, the biblical verses. So for an example of that on the subject of Teshuvah, we looked in the last couple of weeks at some of the biblical examples, but the way the Talmud looks at it, that is very unique. And I think an example of that is what it says in, uh, in Avodah Zarah, in Tractate Avodah Zarah, uh, where it discusses the, which I'll come back to also later, uh, the idea that Teshuvah is so foundational to Jewish spirituality. The, the idea of return, the idea of response, the idea of repentance, the idea of inner transformation, that the Talmud tells us that, in fact, the whole reason why certain sins happened was only in order to bring about the concept of Teshuvah in the world. The Talmud locates two particular sins that trouble it. One of them is the sin of the people of Israel at the golden calf. Uh, this is astonishing. Uh, it's still astonishing even when we read it today, because obviously the Jewish people themselves were already existing at a high level. God has said to them, you know, I wish that you would always be like this. When they receive the Torah and they develop this covenantal relationship with God, and then Moses walks out the room for a few days and off they go, and they're doing idol worship. And the rabbis are troubled by this. They go, oh, well, why would they even be in that space to even do that? And the other sin that troubles the Talmud is, of course, the uh, sin of King David. Who, uh, he writes the Psalms. He's a faithful servant of God. He's humble. He's got all the things going on. And suddenly he does this uh, incredible, uh, incredibly... Uh, miss an inappropriate deed that we spoke about in the last couple of weeks. So the Talmud comes and tells us that the entire reason why these sins happened was in order to bring, and, and uniquely exegetically from the Talmud's perspective, was only in order to bring about the concept of Shashua. And we have those two examples because one, re one applies to the Shashua uh, of an individual, and the other applies to the teshuva of a community. And we need both of those examples because if we just had the one of the individual, uh, we wouldn't necessarily know one from the other. And likewise, if we only had about the teshuva of a community, we wouldn't necessarily work out the individual from that. But in both cases, uh, the individual and the community are afforded this opportunity of self-transformation so radically, according to the Talmud, that that's even the reason why those sins are recorded. So that's an example of how the Talmud approaches it exegetically, and it places Teshuva as the central motif in the whole of the biblical narrative. Even sins that people do, they only do to have a transformative outcome. It doesn't imply that we should be running around doing sins in order to be able to say to people, oh, I'm only sinning so that I can do Teshuva. Because if you go and you run around and you sin in order to do that, uh, you're not going to be, uh, uh, your, your teshuva is not going to be that authentic. It will simply be an excuse for your sin. 
But in retrospect, the Talmud looks that way at these, uh, these incredible episodes. But I want to now move to uh, the uh, crux of what I want to talk about today, which is the, uh, uh, the, the Talmudic... Uh, <laughs> so, some very, very unique passages about Teshuvah that give us an idea of the way the Talmud develops the concept of Teshuvah. Teshuvah was a concept that is really presented to us by the, the prophets of, of the Bible uh, who uh, help us to understand that this is a phenomenal gift to humanity. But in the uh, last tractate uh, in the, at the, at towards the end of, uh, of, of the tractate of Yoma. Uh, the Talmud talks about Teshuvah quite extensively. And what we're finding there is that a number, as you can imagine, since it's a topic in Judaism, uh, it has a, no, a number of halachot, a number of uh, practical uh, directives and parameters around Teshuva, those they're they're extensive. I mean, they're many. Those are summarized, for example, by Maimonides, by the Rambam in his Hilchot Teshuva, the Laws of Teshuva, but which are too many for us to discuss now. But I just want to focus on a couple of interesting aspects of them. And we spoke last week about this idea of restoration, this idea of the fact that we need to uh, seek redress for the wrongs that we have done. And as everybody, I'm sure, in this room famously knows, uh, if you have offended someone with your words, you need to go and seek forgiveness from them. And the Talmud tells us that you should do that three times. After you've gone to someone three times and you've said to them, I'm sorry, I've offended you uh, and shown a contrition, and, and a humble respect uh, and a humble uh, request for forgiveness. The Talmud says you've done that three times, you are uh, exempt from any further efforts. Uh, you've tried your best. And that's a famous halakha that we know. Uh, the Talmud will also tell us in that same passage that if the person you have offended, have offended has passed away, so you can't go and ask them directly for forgiveness, then you should go to their burial site, you should go to their grave and take a minyan with you and in front of the minyan and in front of the person's final resting place, you should ask forgiveness. There's a number of Psalms you should say and so on and you should ask forgiveness. That's important to remember because that's going to figure when we talk about certain other people uh, next week that actually tried to do that uh, with uh, people that they had offended who had passed away. And therefore, Teshuvah is so fundamental and so central to our way of looking at spirituality and our way of living in the world that even if the person you've offended has passed away, your obligation to go and ask forgiveness from the way that you've offended them uh, doesn't uh, you're not absolved from that that doesn't go away and so we can see kind of an angle here where teshuva is very much located within the psychological makeup of the person that sinned the person you've sinned against might have been in the next world but you still have resolution to do in this one very important and we learn about figures like rabbi zera and so on great spiritual rabbis who if they felt that someone had offended them they would constantly make themselves available to them so that the other person could apologize to them. It's not just that you go running around seeking the person you need to apologize to. If you feel that someone needs to apologize, don't make yourself scarce to them. I mean, we think about this today. If we feel that someone has offended us, so what most people do today is that they avoid that person. They say, I don't want to see that person. That person offended me. But the true spiritual approach is that if you think someone has offended you, make yourself available to them that they can apologize. And uh, there's a very uh, fascinating uh, case about that that I actually have spoken about before. Uh, the incredible case of uh, Abba Aricha, uh, otherwise known in the Talmud as Rav, 
probably the first of the great sages of the Gemara, when the Mishnah was completed in, uh, in, in the land of Israel, uh, edited pretty much by Rabbi Yehuda HaNasi in his generation in round about the year 200 CE, the shift of centrality of the Jewish world really moves after that to Babylonia, and we start the phase of the Gemara, that phase of the Talmud that takes the Mishnah, which is the, the essentialized oral Torah written down in succinct form, and starts to unpack it and expand it and apply it. And that's the whole, that, that, that really is the rise of rabbinic Judaism, as we understand it, the, the uh, development of the, of the Talmud in Babylonia between the third and sixth centuries. And that project was started off by Abba Aricha, who we know as Rav. Uh, and uh, there's a famous story uh, told about Rav uh, in, in that section of Yoma uh, towards the end of the tractate dealing with Yom Kippur. So uh, uh, and I'm, I'm just going to kind of give a, 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 a loose uh, translation of that because um, it tells us that Rav had a... Uh, a bit of an issue with someone, and he, uh, it was a butcher, actually. I don't, know, uh, I don't know if any of you have ever been offended by your butcher or have uh, ever had uh, issues of complaint where you feel that you were, you were wronged by the butcher in some ways. But uh, Rav had that sort of situation. So um, he's waiting around, and this butcher doesn't come to him to apologize. And in fact... Uh, uh, it doesn't come to him on the eve of Yom Kippur. And the eve of Yom Kippur, as you know, is a very, very special time to uh, try and restore balances. And to you, we, we were always ringing up everybody and going, oh, if I've done anything to offend you, uh, please forgive me. And people do that almost as a kind of a ritual. But in some cases, they do that to everyone they know, except the actual people they've offended. Uh, uh, who they try and avoid. But in fact, you should really sit down before Yom Kippur and think, who have I offended? And you should uh, contact them and seek their forgiveness. So Rav decided that he would go and visit this butcher. Uh, and when he visited the butcher, that he would afford the butcher an opportunity to apologize to him. So uh, the Talmud tells us that Rav uh, uh, heads off to the butcher and on the way, he meets another great sage, a sage called Rav Huna. And Rav Huna said to him, where are you going? And he said, I'm actually going to try and make peace with that, uh, with that, with that dude, with that butcher. And uh, Rav Huna could tell the look on Rav's face. And uh, apparently, um, apparently uh, Rav Huna knew the butcher. Uh, so he already was predicting that uh, this outcome was not going to be good. And he said uh, that uh, Rav is actually going to end up killing someone uh, based on uh, what I can see over here. And in fact, um, what happened was that Rav, Rav uh, went and he stood in the butcher shop. And uh, the guy was, uh, the butcher at the time, was sitting and he was uh, chopping up some meat, um, uh, chicken or whatever. And, uh, and, and he lifted up his eyes and he saw Rav standing there. And he said to him, uh, 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 go away. I, I, I don't have anything to do with you. Uh, and uh, instead of apologizing, he basically told Rav to bog off. And as he was doing that, uh, he chopped a bone and a bit of the bone flew out uh, from the... from from the, uh, from the cleaver, and it stuck in his, it went into his neck, and it killed him. That's, that, that, that's the Talmud's way of saying that if someone comes to apologize to you, you really, really should forgive them. That's the, that's the nice outcome. You should certainly forgive them if they're one of the great spiritual leaders of the generation. But even an, even an ordinary person, you should forgive them if they come to you uh, and seek genuinely seek uh, your forgiveness. However, you don't have to.
You don't have to. This idea that the sages were seeking people out so that these people could apologize to them was because the behavior of these rabbis was extraordinary. They actually went out of their way to forgive people. But even if someone comes to you to apologize, you should, but you don't have to. And that we involves an extraordinary story that I want to uh, just look at for a few minutes uh, that actually is so powerful because it relates to the uh, it, rela it relates to the origins of the Talmud itself. And I have to do this reasonably quickly because I've just realized that, uh, that it's already 10-2, but this is a, this is a complex story. I, I didn't know whether to include this or not uh, because uh, I have one other theme from the Talmud I want to discuss after this, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just want to run through this quickly because I want to show you the centrality of Teshuvah. Uh, Rav himself before he went to Babylonia, was a great student of the editor of the Mishnah, Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi. And when he was uh, a young rabbinic student, uh, well, not just a student, he was already almost a master in his own right, he gave a class. Uh, and at this class, various people came into the study hall to hear this class. It was not the main lecture of the day. It was like a pre-lecture. So people were arriving at different points. And each time one of the great sages of the generation entered the room, Rav, out of respect for them, went all the way back to the beginning of his talk. It would be a little bit like if I was giving this talk now and uh, Rabbi Ganendi suddenly walked in and I said, oh, you didn't hear the beginning. It was a really good beginning. I'm going back to the beginning. And then 10 minutes later, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs walked in and I said, oh, Jonathan Sachs is here. I've got to start from the beginning again. And then, I don't know, um, uh, some other great rabbi walks in and I'm going, oh, he's walked in. So Rav was doing this and eventually got to the point where one rabbi walked in and Rav said, you know what, I can't keep going back to the beginning. And uh, so he didn't. And this rabbi was incredibly offended. One of the great, uh, Rabbi Hanina, one of the great uh, rabbis of the generation, and Rav went to him on 13 Yom Kippurs in a row to seek forgiveness, and he didn't forgive him. And eventually, uh, th there's a whole reason there, and eventually, as a result of that constant cloud over their relationship, uh, Rav ended up going to Babylonia, uh, where he started the whole Talmudic project. So in a sense, the engine of the whole of the Talmud really begins uh, from a case of someone uh, leaving in order to avoid um, causing offense. Uh, because they had tried to seek repentance, they had tried to, or to seek forgiveness, they'd done Teshuvah, they realized they had offended this person, and even though Rav was not obligated to do that more than three times, he did it 13 Yom, Erev Yom Kippurs in a row in order to try and get the repentance of uh, Rabbi Hanina. Some of you are sitting there going, well, that's all very well, David, you've discussed different aspects of, of Teshuvah, but you haven't actually you probably haven't given the main one that really embodies the philosophy of Teshuva as the rabbis of the Talmud saw it, uh, because you haven't, uh, and, and so I'm going to cover that particular aspect now. Uh, I wanted to talk about the uh, exegetical implications of the Talmud on Teshuva. I wanted to talk about the halachic implications, and bearing in mind, I'm only touching the surface of isolated points the exegesis on Teshuvah, the halachic implications of Teshuvah, extensive right across the Talmud. But I want to talk for a few minutes about the moral imperative of Teshuvah, the moral dimension of it, which if you're going to look at any single story in the Talmud, if the topic of Teshuvah in the Talmud ever comes up at your dinner table, this is the story that you would need to know because this essentializes it. And it's the famous episode. We've only got about seven minutes to unpack it. So I'm going to try and get to the core of it. 
It is, of course, the famous episode of Rabbi Elazar of Bar Dordaya. And what happened was, is that this is also from the tractate of Avodah Zarah, and there's a whole section of Avodah Zarah in which they are discussing uh, the uh, various angles of the concept of prostitution. Why, why the rabbis are going into the topic of prostitution in the tractate on idolatry is something that I'll leave as a, as a cliffhanger for you, those of you who want to dive into Avodah Zarah, meaning the tractate of Avodah Zarah, uh, are welcome. Uh, but there is an entire section where prostitution is a major theme. And what happens is they discuss this chap called Rabbi Elazar bar -Durdaya. And Rabbi Elazar bar -Durdaya was uh, someone that we would probably today refer to as a, uh, as a sex addict. Uh, he basically spent all of his time uh, chasing prostitutes. And he boasted that he had had relations with every prostitute in the world. So he heard that there was one particular harlot, one particular prostitute that was living in a very far place and that uh, she was unique and amazing and that she only uh, took clients who were able to bring her uh, a, a purse full of gold denarium that uh, very, very expensive. So he... Um, he got, all the, he got all that together and he put it in a purse and he went all the way to see her uh, in the course of which he crossed uh, seven rivers and went through all sorts of forests and everything. Talmud's not short on details. It tells you that this was a, this was a big undertaking. This is a real effort. You have to actually be really, really into prostitutes to make this journey. And Elizabeth Rodaya did because he had to have sex with every prostitute in the world. So he finds her and they are having relations. And in the middle of their uh, session, uh, I mean, and, and, and I've got to tell you, I'm about to tell you something, but don't, 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 look, at, don't look at me like that because uh, it's the Talmud. You understand the the Talmud doesn't hold back; it gives it to you in all the gritty detail. But as this individual is having relations with this prostitute, uh, she passes wind in the in the middle of the episode. So uh, obviously, that's an awkward situation. Uh, so she turns around and she says to him, obviously words that are kind of like uh, intuitively placed in her from on high, but she says to him, just as that, having passed wind, just as that which came out can't go back to where it came from, so you will never be able to do teshuva. In other words, he'd reached a point where he'd basically been compared by a prostitute to flatulence that can never go back to where it came from. And that's a pretty low point. And he had a sudden realization about who he was and what he'd been doing. And in that very instant, he decided he needed to do teshuva, but he knew that it was going to be difficult. And he knew that if those words were placed by heaven in the words of the harlot, that, that they, they were valid. In other words, he was never going to be able to do return. So he went and he sat between two mountains and he asked the mountains to intercede for him. And the mountains said, well, we can't because we've got our own issues. We're worried about our own stability in the universe. So we can't intercede with you. So he calls upon heaven and earth and he calls upon all of the various elements uh, around him to intercede, the angels, heaven, all the rest of it. But they all turn around and they say, we can't intercede for you. We can't ask help for you. We know you're genuine, but we've got our own issues that we need to ask a forgiveness for or that we need to worry about our spiritual identity in the world. And at the end of the day, the Talmud tells us that Rabbi Lazar bar sat 
between these mountains and he put his head between his knees in contrition and he cried and he cried and he said the famous words which summarize the whole of the understanding of Jewish spirituality towards forgiveness, uh, towards Teshuvah. And he said, Ein hadavar talui elabi. The whole of my project of seeking repentance, seeking Teshuvah, and the whole inner transformation and the whole shift of my perspective in the world and my asking heaven for forgiveness and my doing Teshuvah, the whole thing depends only on me. Jewish spirituality does not believe that anyone or entity or anything, even heaven itself, can intervene on your behalf, can intercede on your behalf in your act of Teshuvah. It has to be completely authentic from the core of your being because you are the one that sinned. You are the one that has to bear responsibility for that. Or rather, I don't know why I'm using the second pronoun. I am the one who sinned. I am the one who has to bear responsibility for that. I own my own behavior. And I am the one who has to do teshuva. And I am the one who has to go through that transformation. No one died for our sins. The Jewish people are regarded as human, and everybody in the world, not just the Jewish people. We looked last week an entire Gentile city that did Teshuvah. Everybody in the world is responsible for their own behavior, and everybody is responsible for fixing their own mistakes. Ein hadavar talui elabi. Only I can fix it because only I am responsible and I own my own behavior. So that is uh, an essential statement that emerges, probably the most powerful statement of Teshuvah that comes out of the Talmud, the idea of self-responsibility, the idea of we alone. And at the end of the day, uh, Elazar bar the Talmud tells us, sat there and cried and cried and cried until his soul left him and he died. And when he died, a heavenly voice came out and said, Rabbi Elazar bar has been accepted into heaven. Now, I know that some of you are thinking, Rabbi, this rabbi is going around to prostitutes. Well, he wasn't really a rabbi, except that heaven called him a rabbi. And Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi remarked on this. And he said, not only did they accept him into heaven, but they even called him a rabbi. Imagine what they do to people that are already holding themselves at a certain spiritual level once they take responsibility for their own behavior and for their own response to it. So to summarize what I wanted to cover today, on the one hand, the exegetical perspective, the way the Talmud looks at the Shuvah that we've looked at in the Bible and sees in it, sees every act of sin in the Bible as really leading up and an exemplar of the concept of Teshuvah, whether individually or collectively. I wanted to look at some of the halachic ramifications of it, of the importance of restoration. And I wanted to look at the Talmud's concept of essential responsibility and ownership of one's behavior and mode of fixing it. All of these come together. If you have to restore something in the world, if you have offended someone, uh, then you have to fix it. Not just the... Uh, not just the cases where you've done naughty things and you haven't necessarily offended anyone, but if you've offended someone, certainly you own it. Don't ask for others to intercede. Make yourself available, A, to ask for an apology, but if you feel that someone's offended you, make yourself available to them. Walk up and down in front of their house until they apologize to you. Uh, and on that note, I want to wish everybody... I want to wish everyone a very uh, and I, uh, healthy, safe, happy, and successful new year. I hope it is a year filled with much sweetness. I hope everyone is, uh, is written and sealed for in the Book of Life. We will have one more session next week uh, before Yom Kippur, uh, which will be appropriate. But uh, in the meantime, I wish everybody a Shana Tovah
as we had good year. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed the talk. For episode notes and transcripts, or to learn more about David's next classes and projects, visit davidsolomon.online. You can also find David on Instagram or Facebook. Thank you. We hope to see you again soon. Thank you.